Tonight we have a guest speaker, David Chadwick, and um, he's the author of Crooked Cucumber, as well as uh, Zen is right here, and um, is has been playing a key role in the preservation of Suzuki Roshi's lineage, and as a website, uh, kook.com, which is short for Crooked Cucumber. Um, so welcome, David. Very nice to meet you. Yeah, hi. 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 Les, we meet again. Um, Is it all right if I spotlight you, David? Yeah. So, yeah, then you oh, can yeah. go back we, to gallery. You want. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you can go back to gallery view if you want to see everyone, but this makes it easier for them to see you. I can see some some people. Good. Um, yeah, sure. Well, uh, um, do you need on. help getting back to gallery view? It's in the upper right corner on most laptops if you want to go um, and click view and you can switch between speaker and gallery view. You mean if, you've, if I go to gallery view and don't have to look at a big picture of myself, you can <laughs> Correct. Yes. Do it. So is it that arrow up top to the uh, right? It Here, should be on the right. I'll Are you on the back? Cal review. Oh, I got it. Perfect. There you go. Yeah, I'm a little more comfortable with that. <laughs> <laughs> that way everyone else can see you on the big screen, but you can see everyone else. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Great. Well, do you have more to say? I was just going to say welcome. Very, very honored to have you. And I, I have to say, I love, I love Crooked Cucumber. It's absolutely one of my favorite books. So um, Thank you. Very honored to meet you. Thank you. Um, well, it was written by uh, oh, well, everybody sorry. I, else. I believe, I believe Les is trying to say something. Les, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah. It, it looked like Les was trying to say something, but um, he's on mute, so I can't hear him. Les, are you trying to say anything? Yeah. Now, before before you start, David, I'd, I would like to say something to everybody. Uh, uh, many years ago, at least 20 years ago, uh, I, in the middle of the week, in, in, an, uh, in an evening in the middle of the week, I drove to San Francisco Zen Center to attend um, some kind of function. I forgot what it was, guest speaker or some kind of meeting. And there was a lot of people there. And uh, it was very uh, lively and exciting. Um, but uh, at about nine o'clock, I decided it was getting late and uh, it was it was time for me to go. And so I said goodbye to everybody. And then David came to me and he said, I'm going to walk you to your car. This can be a dangerous neighborhood. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that, Dave. Thank you very much. Even all these oh. years, I remember that act of kindness. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It can be well yeah that that's a good thing to do that's always a good thing to still a good thing to do you know not let somebody go by themselves to the car um but anyway well my pleasure uh and thank you les for wow for wow. quite an impressive uh uh body of teaching in your books and 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 uh, you you uh, you have really uh, kept the Los Altos uh, spirit alive it's been great uh, I've made it there every once in a while <laughs> I I was going there when uh, I would drive Suzuki Rochi there sometimes when it was you know Haiku Zendo to Marion's home and um uh, I remember when uh, Suzuki Roshi ordained Les, it seemed like he knew he, he had somebody he could depend on. But one thing about Americans is we're, th that he found out is, is we weren't necessarily dependable. Like in Japan, if somebody came to the temple uh, and said, I want to dedicate my life to being a priest 
think you get ordained right away, practically, because they they do what they said they were going to do to a very high degree. But in America, he learned that somebody would say that, and then you know, after a few months, he they go, oh well, I got this down. Now I'm going to take up golf. Um, so, uh, but there's some people like like uh, Les and uh, Bill Kwong and Mel, who um, have uh, really stuck with their, and, and there's others, but I'm not gonna list any more, uh, uh, stuck with their uh, initial uh, intent. I, and I admire that. Um, I'm more of a nomad, although not now. Anyway, um, it's really great to be with you all um, in uh, this historically prestigious Zendo group. <laughs> uh, I, uh, uh, incidentally, about Crooked Cucumber, um, I've been posting podcasts uh, since April. I started off with one a week just with the idea of just reading Crooked Cucumber. Uh, from April through September, I read a chapter of Crooked Cucumber and, and with comments. And sometimes the comments would go on for like an hour and a half, uh, uh, once a week on Cuke Audio. Cuke Audio Podbean, if you go to cuke.com, my main website, there's a, a link up top, real obvious. It says Cuke Audio Podcasts. And, um, and uh, so I, I, uh, I did that. But then I, I also, after a while, I added, um, uh, I started doing six podcasts a week. Uh, three, three of them are mini podcasts, M-I-N-I, just reading a vignette from Zen is right here and commenting on it. And uh, then... Uh, once a week, I do something called Life in Bali. I live in Bali that had to do with here. And then once a week, I would do a podcast based on someone uh, involved in the Zen world, uh, usually uh, the Suzuki Roshi lineage. And uh, one of those I, I did focused on less. And, and usually I had guests on that would talk, but, but with less, we, we uh, he, he sent me written material and I read material. So that's one of them. And if you go on the, uh, the, the, the cuke.com podcast page, there's a list of all, I think there've been 25 so far guests. Uh, there's a, you know, a little picture of them and a link to their page on cuke.com. There's a before and after picture usually, <laughs> you know, an earlier one and one recently, and then a link to their podcast um so uh, and you know i had a long one with mel different things like that so uh, while i was uh, doing the the uh, uh reading crooked cucumber i was editing it and i have made corrections through the years uh to it and i actually have the whole thing posted on cube.com with the notes on the right not a ton of them, just a few, but now I've got much more extensive notes and I've made a number of corrections, updates and things like that. So I'm gonna work on coming up with an audio book from the podcast and a uh, second edition. And Bill Shirtliff, who, uh, who comes from that area uh, where you are and was a Suzuki Roshi student and did the Tofu book and the Miso book and the, you know, he did 20 books on soybeans. He's, he's like the world's foremost authority on soybeans. And he also was the first Zen student to do a cookbook at Tassahara called the Tassahara Food Trip, which I have on cube.com. And uh, it was the sort of food we were eating. It was great. Anyway, he wants his, his uh, I believe, ex-wife to do maps for a second edition. And we'd put in a uh, a, uh, an index, stuff like that. So I just wanted to let you know that that was happening. Um, in a, 
one podcast I did that went up. Oh, that's not up yet. I'm going to put it up later today. It's a long talk with a fellow in India. Uh, and it's going a little further. I'm going to put it up on the day I usually put up the Bali one. And um, he's a very interesting guy named David Kubiak, who's worked uh, more in social political fields, um, uh, spreading the word that uh, large corporations are like inoperable cancer that we have to learn to deal with. We can't get rid of them. Oh, they're so out of balance. But uh, one way he's learned, and, and he, he's lived in Japan many years, and, and he, was an, he was a really good friend of Richard Baker's back in the 60s when uh, Richard was there. And uh, uh, one thing he learned in Japan and that helps deal with things is he uh, studied paying attention to what he called qi, which you know the Chinese called qi, which is like hara. Uh, and um, you know, I, I learned from other people. I learned from Suzuki Roshi, I learned from Les, I learned from Mel. I learned from everybody, but I learned from people that don't even necessarily say they're Buddhists because when he started talking about that in, in how the world can deal with its problems, he started talking about we have to focus more on our key uh, and turn our attention uh, toward our body and that can heal our body. And, and he, he talked about attention as the great healer. And so uh, I thought how much that is uh, my practice. And, and, and I, I really appreciated talking to him about that. Um, because like these days, it, it's very hard for even the most uh, uh, the, the person who's the most enthusiastic about their spiritual practice not to get caught up in uh, uh, a lot of uh, information coming from the internet and various sources and to be putting our attention uh, into, you know, out into that. Now, of course, there is really no such thing as out. Everything is in. But I think when we say, uh, let's put our attention inward rather than outward, we, one way to look at it would be n not focusing on the thought stream and uh, on, uh, on uh, not getting caught up in emotions, not getting enslaved by ideas, and believe Suzuki Roshi would say, you know, don't stick to an idea. And um, it's very interesting to me that spiritual practice, what we call, and, and you know, what do people think of something lofty and uh, otherworldly? It actually uh, begins with focusing on the body on what we know, what we are. And fundamentally, uh, uh, universally on the breath. And you know, they say the breath is like a, a bridge between the physical and the spiritual, but I really don't know what the spiritual is and what the physical is. Somebody was asking me recently, what spirit I don't know what spirit is or mind is or consciousness. All I know is there's this, you know, what's right in front of me, what I feel, the sense of I exist. And that that's the uh, an Advaita Vedanta approach, which is very compatible with Zen, is, is um, the, the Advaita Vedanta is like, uh, uh, oh, it's like, Zen Hinduism, you know, Ramana Maharshi, Muji, uh, Nisargadatta, uh, Papaji, various people uh, that 
you know, there's a number of American teachers who've uh, been out of the Advaita Vedanta uh, uh, realm. And it, it focuses on, on the, the, the ancient, most ancient koan, who am I, which comes out of India. Uh, when uh, I went to the, oh God, what was his name? The great, the great Indian guru starts with a V. Ah, one that came to America in like 1895. Anyway, I was in his ashram in at the very southern tip of India. And as you enter this big, you know, on a wall, big letters, who am I? That's um, uh, the, uh, the most ancient uh, koan maybe. And, and uh, the, the, the Advaita Vedanta point of view, which I'm, I've heard Suzuki Roshi express pretty much the same way is that, that sense we have of existing that all beings have, that I exist, I am, that that is, that, that what we do is we interpret that. We think that's a separate self, that we're, um, you no, know, we have this idea of self and we give it, um, we have ideas about what that is. It's constantly interpreting it and clinging to an idea of what that is. And um, what I've noticed uh, the great teachers teaching is uh, stop interpreting it. Just, just pay attention to it. Um, and the, the, um, one universal way of paying attention to that is just to focus on the breath. I've done a lot of, of Vipassana retreats here in Bali because there aren't any Zen retreats and it doesn't matter to me. I mean, it's completely compatible with uh, my uh, past Zen training, especially the the, the Vipass type of Vipassana there is here, which comes out of Burma, which is uh, Myanmar, which is the Mahasi method. And the Mahasi method, you know, I went there and I thought, well, I know Vipassana, they're going to want me to name everything and do all this stuff. I thought, I'm not going to do that. I'll just sit. You know, I just wanted to go sit with people. Even though Suzuki Roshi said, uh, like his master taught him, when you go to a Rinzai temple, practice the Rinzai way. Don't bring, don't lay your trip on them, right? Don't lay your trip on yourself. Do, when you go somewhere else and you're practicing with other people, do their practice. Well, um, but I was most pleased to find out that the Mahasi, Mahasi method is to follow the breath. And with focus on the hara, on the solar plexus, on the tanden, that's another word the Japanese use for that. And there's the word the Chinese use that tanden and hara come out of that sounds very much like tanden, but it's like tian ten or something. And that's, I've sat in retreats here with a Chinese Indonesian who studied Vipassana uh, in the the great Vipassana temple here uh, was founded by Bhante Giri, the, an, an Indonesian, a Balinese, um, who uh, became a Hindu, was going to become a Hindu priest, but it, uh, I'm just saying that, that Bhante Giri, who founded the great Buddhist temple here in Bali, uh, Rama Vihara Arama, that he, uh, was going to become a Hindu priest. But his wife said, no, no, they can have a bunch of wives and stuff. I want you to be a Buddhist priest. And then I, I know you won't get into trouble. So he went to Myanmar 
and came back and founded Brahma Vihara Rama, and it was a big deal. I was quite recognized by that time. The Dalai Lama came, and it's a great temple, and there's a lot of Vipassana retreats there, usually with monks from uh, Myanmar. I did my favorite one though was from an Indian, led by an Indonesian woman who'd broken the tradition, the patriarchal tradition, and uh, uh, had had support from within the the Theravadan world to do that. And uh, but anyway, um, so I was talking about. Uh, uh, I was talking about how I've also sat in retreats with a local uh, uh, teacher. He's a teacher of meditation and healing. And by uh, what I mean by a teacher of healing, he he's not a he doesn't claim to be a healer. He helps people learn how to heal themselves. And um, uh, his method basically gets down to attention, again, to following the breath. He studied with the founder of the, of the Buddhist temple here that I was talking about. But he also, it, he's Chinese Indonesian. He studied with herbalists and Chinese teachers. And um, uh, he, he he, you know, he, he, all, he doesn't tell people don't go to doctors or anything like that. But if you have some problem that's mental or physical, he encourages people to focus on it and breathe into it. And uh, he frequently says, what is it, anicca, um, impermanence. Uh, you know, everything changes. And the, um, you know, thinking about just paying attention uh, as the, how we pay attention as the uh, way to heal our personal and global problems is, um, uh, I have been, that's what I have been thinking about recently. And, and think about it, it's, it's really something that's available to anyone. Anyone can do that. They don't have to, you know, and one thing that I've always noticed teachers stressing is you don't have to be uh, super intelligent to practice. Um, it's that sometimes can even be a, uh, <laughs> an impediment. Uh, uh, but, and, and what is the great esoteric, I always, there's this idea that there's esoteric teaching that's hidden. Uh, I, I'm a little, I mean, I know there are esoteric teachings that are hidden, but I'm really not interested in them. Uh, just following our breath, paying attention to where we are, to who we are. Like uh, Suzuki Roshi would say, you know, that, that, you know, most religions have some object of worship, but we don't really. We just, and what, what is worship means, it means what is worthy of paying attention to. But that what we worship or what, we think is worthy of paying attention to, to is whatever we're doing at the moment. Uh, so again, if we think about inner and outer, there really is no inner and outer uh, because if we're paying attention to looking at the moon, that's pretty outer, <laughs> but it's also inner. Uh, or we can pay attention to our breath. And really, is it any more inner than the moon? Um, somebody asked me, what, 
what is attention and what is inattention? And I thought about that and I thought there's no such thing as inattention. Inattention just means not paying attention to whatever you intended to or were supposed to. You were paying attention to something else. And the main thing we pay attention to is our thought stream and our ideas of self. And so those of us who've run into this sort of teaching we're involved with, I think are very lucky because it focuses on not being enslaved to the thought stream, not being enslaved by beliefs. Uh, the, it, it, it seems to me that belief is maybe not at first, but becomes the, the enemy of our, you know, what we call our spiritual progress. Uh, I read once that the Tibetans call belief the, uh, the first door, but you know, you can't, you, you can't stick to it and get through the next door. So that's what I've been thinking about recently. And that's what I've been focusing on is um, just how lucky I am to be able to be alive and be able to pay attention to follow my breath. And well, one thing Buddha advised that the Japanese are really big on is being still, that you can pay attention more deeply if you're still. And you know, the Japanese have this thing, you know, don't move, right? It's much bigger with them than, than uh, most, well, I don't know, the Vipassana people also want you to be as still as you can. So it's, but it's Buddhist, it goes right back to Buddha, the don't move thing, to be still helps to still our thinking. We sort of have, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't, I hate to categorize what's happening with whatever this is that is unfolding all the time, but we can look at it as being, there being an intellectual element and an emotional element. And, you know, Suzuki Roshi said uh, the intellectual element is easier to calm down than, uh, you know, I, the, the Suzuki Roshi always emphasized daily sitting. He emphasized that over session or retreats because especially back then in the 60s, there were so many fanatic people, all these different characters and everything. And then we had people, you know, sitting a hundred day session by themselves or with just two or three of them, stuff like that. They just thought the more you sit, you know, then you'll get enlightened and stuff like that. And um, so uh, somebody said, well, I just said to him, I just sat a hundred day session, you know, uh, uh, what, what do you think about that? He said, well, don't worry, it'll wear off after a while. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he really emphasized daily city. And one, one thing I've noticed with friends of mine who've gotten into Vipassana really heavy is sometimes uh, they, they don't believe in that because if you know, a lot of the uh, monks will say, uh, you know, that's a waste of time. You gotta sit three months straight uh, for anything worthwhile to happen but you know maybe that is true but um i find that just daily meditation and also meditating in the cracks in other words what does that mean paying attention uh being still you know when you can are just not being enslaved by the thought stream or by whatever's happening in our busy, busy life when we can. What was his name, Thumpton? The, the, the teacher that 
um, the uh, Tibetan uh, Rinpoche or whatever, the Lama that teaches in uh, Point Richmond, he said, uh, I guess he was in England, you know, and there when you get on the, the train, it, it's always got this thing, mind the gap, mind the gap. So anyway, Thebden said, that's right, you should mind the gap. There's going to be these little gaps in your day all the time, and every one of them is an opportunity to meditate. Uh, or what is art? To pay attention to just being. You don't have to have any content. Uh, and, and one of the, the great ideas of faith in Christianity was faith without content. Uh, see, that's, that's really a profound idea of faith. And what is faith without content? It's just paying attention to what is right now with having to name it or know what it is or think about it. Now, I think uh, maybe it would be nice if somebody else said something or asked a question or made a comment. Um, so what do you think about that? Yeah, we can open for questions now. I see uh, Umar has his hand up. Oops, sorry, I tried to unmute you and I muted you. Please unmute yourself, thank you. Hi, David. Um, it was interesting you started talking and um, I remembered I had your book and I found it. Um, thank you and okay. Um, oh, yeah. I found that uh, in the collection that I have. And it's really an interesting book, and your experiences are just amazing. Excuse me. Can you speak louder? Sure. I found your book. Thank you and okay. Um, and your experiences in here are just amazing. And um, it, I think it's called The American Zen Failure in Japan. That's the right. title of the book. Love the subtitle of this book. Um, but... Um, it's interesting you're bringing this up because uh, me and my wife have been having quite a lot of conversations in the morning after sitting that uh, more and more I'm coming to this strange realization that um, it's really not about getting attention any more than it is about giving attention. It's not even, people use this term paying attention. I don't consider that as something that we have to pay for. It's more to me, it's like just give the attention and don't expect anything back from it. And that's has always said, you know, give, don't don't expect anything. And and I've started to understand now that what it is is that we have to give our attention to whatever we're doing, even as you're saying to our breath. So it's more about giving the attention and not expecting anything to show up in our lives or come. If it comes, great. If it doesn't come, it's okay too. We go on. And um, I've started to deeply sort of understand that, and I can't put it in better words, but I've started to understand that in a much better manner. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That uh, I agree. I think I think probably any verb we use with it will fall short, you know, because ultimately paying attention, giving attention, whatever it is, that's, that's a, you know, a very dualistic idea. And I think ultimately what we are, what the whole cosmos is, everything is, is awareness, mm -hmm. undifferentiated awareness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ramana Maharshi, the you know, the great Advaita Vedanta teacher from the early part of the, the last century. He said the ultimate spiritual statement is from the Bible. It's I am that I am, mm. um, which uh, is, it's, it's a, you know, it's like the ultimate self-awareness, mm. the awareness of 
the great self. But you know, those are Hindu terms. And then Buddha came along and said, well, there's no big self. There's no little self, really. He said, you know, there's no Atman, no Anatman. Um, and then Suzuki Roshi came along and talked about big mind and small mind. Um, so, you know, whatever we say, there's going to be somebody coming on afterwards saying, well, you know, not really that. And then you get to the Diamond Sutra where Buddha starts negating everything he says. <laughs> you know, that was great. I love that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate that. Leave Marsulo. No, um, uh, that's my wife, Lee. My name is Umar. Oh, you're Umar. Oh, hi, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have uh, Travis. Thanks, Umar. Thank you, David. Um, Can you speak up a bit, Travis? You're a bit low. Sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. The louder you speak, the better. Okay, great. Um, so um, thanks for uh, talking tonight. And uh, I'm a, you know, a fan of your website. And in particular, um, I've read the interviews with uh, Grant Edgy several times. Um, and I'm, re I'm really interested in, in him as one of those early students at Zen Center. Um, and, you know, it's clear in, in those interviews that you're, you you had a friendship with him. Um, and he's one of those uh, guys, as I read those interviews, that uh, really paid attention. And he, uh, he you would ask him an interview question, and then the conversation would go along. And then you would sort of snap back and be like, okay, but we were, we were talking about, you know, Suzuki Roshi in the early days. And uh, I'm just wondering if you, you could say more about him. Um, he, he really strikes me as uh, one of, you know, those first serious students at Zen Center. If I could say more about, would you? Graham. Uh, uh, Graham Petchy. More, if I could say more about about Graham Petchy. Graham. Uh -huh. Any particular aspect of Graham? I could go on a long time about Graham. He and I were very close. Uh, I mean, I was in touch with him uh, from the '60s until the the week he died. Yeah. It, it your interviews with him are very moving, so I, I come back and I read those interviews quite often. And ah. his, his, his sincerity is, is very, it comes through in the interviews. Like he talks about like really going for it in, in those early days in the 60s and, and going to right. and all of that. And it just finds him very intriguing. So I was wondering if you could say more about his early practice. You want me to say more about his early practice? Yes, if you can. Well, all right. Um, Graham, Graham uh, started off with what he called a nagging question when he was a teenager. And I guess his family, yeah, they were Church of England. His father was a Coldstream guard. Those are the ones that guard the queen, the royal family. It's like, you can't be more proper or more British. And, but yet he, and, and he went into a, an Episcopalian uh, monastery of sorts, you know, uh, and was even thinking of being an Episcopal uh, Church of England priest or, yeah. Uh, but then, you know, he had very high standards and he found hypocrisy and it fell short. So then, Believe it or not, he went to Rome where he thought, well, the, there I will find the true way and the pure path and was shocked. <laughs> How naive, wow, to find that. It, well, that's where he met Pauline. And basically after they met, 
the day they met, they were married. I mean, they weren't formally married, but they got married pretty soon. Uh, and her mother was a theosophist and was uh, at a big library. And, and Pauline had already met Krishnamurti and D.T. Suzuki. So Graham was introduced by Pauline and Pauline's mother into this whole world of uh, Eastern religion, of Hinduism, of Buddhism, and he liked Zen. So uh, he figured out, he actually didn't know anything in particular, but he figured out San Francisco would be the place to go and ended up, up finding the Zen Center in Suzuki Roshi. And, Suzuki, and he had been meditating, sitting in a chair on the way over on the boat. Now, Christmas Humphreys, who founded the London Buddhist Society or whatever it's called, and was an early writer on, on Buddhism and uh, had believed that Westerners shouldn't meditate over 10 minutes or they might uh, go crazy. Uh, and that's, think of that. And so Graham was meditating 10 minutes at a time in this chair coming over on the boat, but maybe he went a little longer sometimes. He, but then he met Suzuki Roshi and Suzuki Roshi taught him how to sit with his legs crossed, and that wasn't hard for him. You know, some people can sit pretty easy at first. Richard Baker was the opposite. I mean, he was like this and that and cushions and took him forever to get into half lotus. Uh, but Graham, it was very easy and he sat up straight and Suzuki Roshi recognized it. He said, you take, you know, you sit very well. And so right, for then, from then on, Graham was, you know, that was 1961 in the spring. From then on, he was the, the example for all. He sat straight, he never moved, uh, and he was really dedicated. And um, then uh, uh, Richard Baker came soon thereafter and he modeled himself after Graham. He saw, there, Graham, there's the guy that really takes this seriously, you know? And um, so, um, and, and that especially uh, that he felt that Graham, Graham thought that we could be, we could understand this, that we could be, that we could, yeah. well, actually there was somebody else who went first, Gene Ross. Uh, uh, was a, a had been sitting with Suzuki since oh, a week or two after he arrived, uh, and um, met with Gene and Della Gertz and Betty Warren, the three of them, and um, so Gene went to Japan and he, she did very well at AAG and and uh, studying with Fujimoto. Um, Graham had a harder time. Uh, um, you know, he, again, he was disappointed with AAG, with what he found to be hypocrisy there. Um, you know, he had very high standards. Sitting with uh, Rinzai teacher uh, Kobore at Daitokuji, and it was more straightforward. And Graham ended up Graham did do two practice periods at um, AAG, but they were hard on him. And because he wouldn't break any rules, uh, he wouldn't eat outside of meals. He'd get malnutrition, end up uh, in, in not really in a hospital. He said in the hospital, but he wasn't. He was staying in a doctor's home nearby. Uh, you know, and, and then I know somebody else who was there. It was ordained by Suzuki, Ron Browning, who got who got uh, serious malnutrition there. And again, same thing, being very rigid, thinking you have to follow all the rules and those who aren't are hypocrites. In Japanese, really, they're sort of loose in a way. I mean, they're, they're sort of uptight and rigid in a way you might think. But another thing, you know, if there's not enough food, they'll bring some, you know. Um, so Graham came back to America and uh, 
Suzuki Roshi told him, don't tell people all the bad stuff. It'll discourage him. He was really worried at the very first about discouraging people. I don't think we have to worry about that anymore. Uh, and so Graham went back and he, he started studying with Uchiyama over there, who was Zazen only, the opposite of Eiheiji. Uh, Uchiyama was the disciple of Koto Sawaki, and it was, you know, they didn't want anything to do with AAG or SOGG and all that stuff, right? <laughs> Philip Wilson, Gene Ross, they got along in that system because, you know, they, they were more easygoing in a way, you know? And, but uh, Richard and Graham, they, 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 they couldn't take it. And they found other things. I mean, you know, people are different. So from that point on, really, Uchiyama was Graham's teacher until Uchiyama died. And that wasn't long ago. That was like 15 years ago or something. And I mean, he always revered Suzuki Roshi, but uh, Suzuki wanted him to come back and help with Tassahara, but you know, he'd wait too long to ask him. Even Graham would plan ahead and have jobs. And I don't know if it would have worked anyway. So, you know, it was sort of looked at at Zen Center was like that he'd quit. And they do that in Japanese temples too. Some monk can be there for 20 years and then decide, well, that's enough of that and go off and do something. Ah, oh, he's quit, he's a loser, he's, you know. He's a quitter. No, I don't think so. He don't know what's happening with other people's practice. And Graham had a very serious practice with Ujiyama. He had his devils and uh, he had a problem with alcoholism his whole adult life. And uh, it was a serious problem. And I know I was very close with him and his wife because they lived in Sebastopol where I lived for years and I was always in touch with him. But you know, again, I don't even, th I don't think we can write people off because of their problems and their faults and their shortcomings. Everybody's on a spiritual path and we really can't judge them. Um, you know, it's nice having somebody like Suzuki Roshi who had rather exemplary behavior, but even so in Shaku, who uh, uh, came to that, uh, that, religious oh vivekananda that's the guy in india i said i went to his um his uh temple and it said who am i vivekananda blew everybody's mind at the big religious uh convention of religions of the world in chicago in like 1897 or something like that i don't i um but so in shaku had come from japan and uh, was made less of a great show than Viva Kananda. And Viva Kananda was great, but he was just, you know, it was lower profile, but people were impressed with him. And he actually made, established some ties in Illinois and uh, various places. And he brought Nyogen Senzaki and left Nyogen Senzaki at Golden Gate Park and said, bye-bye. And Yogan Suzaki stayed in America, but so in Shaku was a great early inside teacher, and he was very strict with himself. He had impeccable behavior, but he said it's good to study with two types of teachers. He said there's those with good behavior, and there's those who don't have good behavior, and it's good to study with both. I thought that was very interesting coming from him, uh, and. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. So anyway, that's Graham. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, David. We, we have May and then Anna. May. Oh, hi, May. Hi. Um, wow. Well, um, great. Great to have opportunity to listen to your talk. Um, when you talk about, thank you for cutting the chase, it's all about just pay attention. Um, I'm curious, like, what happens when you pay attention? And then I know there's something to do with mindfulness and awareness. I know they're different. 
sorry to put this um, duality question, but I hate it, but you know, this is how our mind works. Um, so basically pay attention versus mindfulness and awareness, how this, I don't know, how mindfulness gradually evolving into awareness or what happened? Um, my second well, question that I, yeah. okay. No, um, go on. You, yeah, my second question is, uh, is um, awareness, I know this is the ultimate, ultimate stage we, we might we might want to re reside on and then I, i'm just wondering is this still a concept awareness or it just we can't describe we just have to pick up the word awareness yeah well you know actually there are no words for uh reality anything we name it will fall short of course, and uh, uh, you know that you know what what is attention, what is awareness, what am I? That's something that each of us find out for ourselves, and nobody else can tell you. Um, you know, uh, I'm just like you. Uh, uh, you know, we're practicing the way in as best as we can. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we might feel like we're falling short. Uh, Suzuki was always telling people you know, don't judge themselves. Don't put yourself down. Don't, you know, your your delusion is, you know, part of your practice. Your, um, so, you know, what it's like a Tia Strozer. You know, she's she's. I don't know if she's still got that group in Brooklyn, but you know, she was. Uh, priest in the Zen center who, who, who studied with Suzuki Roshi. And she, she went to him once and asked him, what is bowing? What is bowing? She said, or what is this bow we do? What are these bows we do? Right, we were doing all these bows, right? We bowed like nine times in the morning uh, service and you know, uh, then we bowed three times, we're always bowing. She said, what is this bowing we're doing? And she said, he just started bowing, you know, standing up and going down and bowing and just kept doing it. Uh, and so she said uh, her practice after that was just to ask, what is this bow? So, um, uh, yeah, what is attention? What is awareness? Who am I? What is this? What's happening? Um, we have zazen and extending zazen into our daily lives. Uh, and, and you know, in uh, Zen, you know, in Dogen's teaching, you have meimitsu no kafu. Meimitsu no kafu means uh, careful attention to details taking care of every little thing. Uh, so what is that other than just paying attention minute after minute to what we're doing? And, um, you know, I actually, uh, I have, I say thank you a lot. Uh, I've been around a lot of uh, may all beings be happy. Uh, it's a big deal here. Samoga Samoahe Duper Bahagia. I can say that to uh, Hindu, Buddhist. There are not a lot of Buddhists here. There's a lot of Hindus. Uh, but even Muslims will, will appreciate that. I'm around Muslims a lot. The, things are pretty, uh, people are pretty compatible here where, where I live. You know, it depends on where you are. But mainly on this island, uh, that people are pretty compatible. But um, 
I say thank you a lot. And I find saying thank you is a type of giving attention. I, I like this, what you were saying. Where, where are you? Uh, yeah, you, um, Umar. Yeah, giving attention rather than paying attention. Yeah, paying, what? How much does it cost? Uh, so, uh, you know, it's just each of us has to find our own way. And I think dropping, dropping the names is good. But one of the Vipassana trips is to name things, right? <laughs> but actually, that's a way of dropping names, too, because in naming it, it's trying to free us from, from, you know, having complicated thinking that we're all attached to about it. Yeah. Um, you. Now, you had two questions. But... Oh, um, I, I, I guess you answered all, you know. Oh, um, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, let's just drop the name, <laughs> drop the word. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Anna and then Teresa. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I was, I really appreciated your comments about being enslaved to the thought stream. And I've been thinking a lot about attention and how we're living in this time where our attention is a commodity um, and we're influenced, uh, our attention is influenced kind of constantly. Um, and I've been feeling that a lot the past couple of weeks. And I wonder if you have thoughts on that and also in your collecting stories um, all this time, if you have a story that you think would be helpful for that. A story, <laughs> a story that would be helpful. You know, I deal all day, every day in stories, but if you ask me to think of one, um, ooh, okay, I'll tell you one. And I, I would have put this in Crooked Cucumber, but I didn't know about it yet. Uh, so I'm working on a book called Tassara Stories, so I'm slipping it in there, but... Um, Incidentally, I'm reading Tassahara stories now on podcasts. When I finished reading Crooked Cucumber, I just started reading draft pieces from Tassahara stories. And I've got a lot written, but it's not put together well like Crooked Cucumber or Thank You and Okay. And maybe it never will be, who knows. But um, uh, when uh, Suzuki was a young monk, uh, very young monk, he was out uh, in the bitter cold in the snow, uh, cutting firewood with his master, Gyokujun Son. Um, you know, they were both using, uh, you know, axes and saws. And you know, the Japanese saw like we push, but they pull. And, uh, but like our saw, if theirs are even thinner, you know, you can go like this, right? With the blade of the saw. Uh, so in the bitter cold, uh, soon when Suzuki didn't notice, pulled the uh, blade of his saw back and snapped it on Suzuki's face. And uh, that was a very painful, shocking experience for him as, you know, probably a 13 year old boy or something. But, um, and, uh, you know, we can't do things like that in America. <laughs> uh, and it's very hard for us to appreciate things like that, you know, it seemed pretty abusive. But anyway, that was them. And um, that was someone saying to him in an old fashioned way, you know, wake up, you know, your mind's wandering, pay attention to what you're doing. 
There, there's an attention story. Thank you. Was that okay? Now you had, what, what else did you want? That was a story. I appreciate it. Oh, is that good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, ouch. Painful to think about. Mm -hmm. um so Teresa's next but actually Anna I I felt that there was a little part of the question that I didn't think was answered which was about um our attention being a commodity mm -hmm. I find that this is a real thing in especially when a lot of propaganda a lot of commercials were just being bombarded with information so I don't know if you had anything to say about that David about like how to manage that being bombarded with information. Who's talking? I can't see which person. Oh, this is Bonnie. Sorry. This is Bonnie. Hi. Where? Where? Uh, well, I'm in. It's a little dark. Can you see me? Can now? I see you? Uh, oh, there you are. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. I got you. All right. Well, well, sure. Um, you know, everything it, in our culture gets commercialized and commodified. But what is it? What it's commodifying is just the the word, the idea. Um, I mean, that doesn't need to uh, bother us. I mean, I don't care when people name products as Zen this or Zen that, that or say, oh, that's very Zen, <laughs> or you know. And there might be a lot of things happening that make you sort of go, uh, sort of cringe, you know, too much mindfulness of this and mindfulness of that, you know. You keep repeating the same thing over and over, it starts getting like water torture, you know. Um, but we can't control what other people do. And, and that's just normal. I mean, we live in a society that commercializes everything. It tries to make a dollar out of everything and every, and, and it's very hard to escape that. But um, uh, we don't have to pay attention to it. Uh, just let it run its course. And of course, a lot of times we can't escape a certain amount of that, but just don't let it bother you. Um, actually, it's a, um, it, there might be something positive about it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, at, at least it's a sign that um, the the concept of mindfulness has, you know, it's definitely in the mainstream. Uh, and again, what is it? What is mindfulness? Um, I don't I don't use that word much or think about it, but it's one of the eightfold paths, you know, right? Mindfulness. So, um, I mean, what can you do other than, than say what is right mindfulness? And, you know, I'm wondering right now, what is what right mindfulness? Uh, I think it's just re resuming our original nature will be right mindfulness. Our original nature, I think, will 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 take care of all the eightfold path. Thank you. Um, Teresa. Uh, hi David. Thank you for hi. thank you for being with us today. I have two questions. One is you said that uh, what's been in your mind lately is uh, paying attention as a way to heal our personal and global problems. So I wanted to ask you, what, what's the healing power of attention? What's the what? Healing, healing power. power? Yeah, no, yeah, no, no that's they... very interesting. What's the healing power of attention? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I'm, uh, the, the, um, you know, when I, I was, uh, 
talking to my friend David Kubiak about this, he said, you know, if you just look at all these different healing trips and awareness trips and uh, uh, self-help trips, you know, one thing they, they tend to have in common is putting our attention on our on our body or on uh, with Murtada, the, the local teach, healing and meditation teacher, just putting our attention on, a, on whatever problem we have, physical or spiritual. And well, I don't know, it's like, I, I think it's with that, that it's the, the, the magic of, existence of you know i i actually i grew up on on uh, uh faith healing and uh, so and and our idea was was not other power you know the self-power other power type thing our type of faith healing was not asking for another power to do it it was just sort of like being aware. It was, it was knowing that originally we were healthy and that whatever problem we have arose out of some uh, misunderstanding or mistake that we have made. Now, we didn't get into past lives. We didn't know, my mother did finally, but my father never did. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what, the, I, I don't know the answer to your question any more than you do, you know, but there does seem to be a universality of uh, in, 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 of teaching around, you know, getting over our problems, mental and physical that, that, you know, that it, I'm not talking about uh, the taking chemicals, you know, like medicine and drugs, that it has to be done sometimes too. There seems to be a sort of coming from all directions, different methods of paying attention, breathing into our problem, uh, uh, focusing our mind on it, focusing our breath on it. We can say any number of things, but it's been pretty effective in my life. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I have various physical problems that I deal with. And um, all right, these days, mainly what I do is just breathe into them. I don't try to think anything in particular because I think that uh, I, I do say, I do have uh, stuff I run through, like may all beings be happy, may all beings be healthy, may all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. And then sometimes I will just start listing, you know, everybody in the family and friends and this and that. But Murtada here, he says, start with yourself. May I be happy, healthy, free from harm, love life and awaken. And uh, I also do uh, that about our pets. <laughs> huh. Um, so, you know, I really can't answer that. I mean, these sorts of things that uh, are really for each of us to answer for ourselves. But, you know, the great thing is, what, what did, in, in Buddhism, we have Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, right? Buddha, you know, you can say different things for what that means. I just say that's you know, great reality, our original nature, our undivided, wonderful reality. Dharma is the teaching and Sangha is all of us. And it's really great not to be alone, you know? 
And um, I, I love living here and work a lot. I can concentrate on work, but I have connections with all sorts of, uh oh, your internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Yeah, you cut yes. out for a few seconds, but you're back. Yeah. But anyway, we, and it, in a sense, we, even though we're not together physically, we have each other. And you have that, that to me, that we're all Sangha, everybody, non Buddhists, everybody, but also there's concentric circles, or maybe they're not circles, maybe they're more squiggly lines. So you've got a very definite uh, Kanando Sangha there, and that's a great thing. But really, each one of you is, is, um, also alone within that um, on your own path, you know, trying to follow the way as best you can. Um, that's what we all do. And it's nice to have, to know there's others that we relate to, that's the Sangha. Dave and then Brenda. Oh, sorry. I, I have another question that I didn't get the chance to ask, uh, if I may. Um, David, I wanted to ask you also, um, what, what is the most important thing you learned uh, from Suzuki? <laughs> That's funny. Um, pardon me for saying that. It's funny, but, but, but what you said isn't funny. What I think of first is funny is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Danny Parker just edited and put out a book of Ed, Ed Brown's lectures called The Most Important Point. Uh, and, and that's based on Suzuki Roshi saying, the most important point is to figure out what is the most important point using the phrase, most important and there's uh, like you know 87 times he said most important point and 85 times the most important thing and then uh, there's another that's it's about 100 so there's another 80 or something where he used most important in another way so um it, it every day it was something else was the most important point but it's because it, it all gets down to the same thing. It gets down to whatever we're, we're dealing with. Now, you know, whatever, you know, I think maybe one of the most important things to me is the, how accepting he was of people. That was a big deal to a lot of people. They felt like they'd never met anybody. I mean, this is, cannot tell you how many people have told me this that they'd never met anybody who understood them or who accepted them fully. Now, that wasn't a big deal to me. I, you know, I grew up in, I didn't have that sort of problem when I grew up. I had a very accepting, understanding family. So I never thought about that, but it's very common uh, uh, for people to say that. So he, he made everybody feel and this is true, feel special, almost everybody, not everybody, feel special and accepted. Uh, uh, special, I don't know if I should use the word special. It's used so much in education and stuff. Like every child is special. Um, but uh, so, you know, just in how to relate to people, to be open and understanding and welcoming to all people and forgiving. Uh, uh, forgiving, that's, you know, not judging might be a better way to say it. Non-judgmental accepting a way of relating to people. That, that's good to be around. And I think it's very helpful to all of us, but also strict strict with himself and then if you get close strict with you uh so there's there's room for that too and uh you know Dalla Gertz said 
the main thing he taught was just be yourself. Um, hey, incidentally, in this um, uh, book, Tom Sarno's stories I'm working on, I want to use an Oscar Wilde quote as the epigraph, you know, a little quote, the first of the book. Your you internet out. connection is unstable. Yeah, you cut out, so we missed the Oscar Wilde quote, but. Um, All right, I thought so because everybody was frozen. Yeah. Uh, the Oscar Wilde quote is, be yourself, everyone else is taken. It's a good one. Got it? Yeah. Uh, so be yourself is pretty universal. Uh, and you know, what does that mean? I'd say, I'd say to me, maybe the, the something I think is very fundamental about Suzuki Roshi is there was no particular teaching. It's just like every minute, uh, new reality, new. I think next time we should get the speaker's phone number because if they connected via phone, then the internet connection issue wouldn't happen to their audio. So I think um, that might be a good backup plan. Yes. Do you think we could do that now still for the rest of the we, we can, but it's almost 9.30, yeah. so I don't know how much longer we'll be. Yeah. Thank are you, we here? Yes, we are here. You yeah, were, we're saying here, there here. was... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you were saying there was no particular teaching uh, every minute. Um, you know, I, I don't think you can, you can pin him down to any particular teaching, no. He was just encouraging us to practice, to realize the truth. And um, he would say he didn't believe in any particular hard and fast truth because it's beyond naming, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a, a Tibetan list of what, why if, if, if ultimate reality is all there is and it's immediate and right here, then why don't, why don't we know it? Why isn't it obvious? And it's because there's the four difficulties or something that first is because it's too close. Uh, sometimes they say too intimate. The uh, second is it's too subtle. It's so subtle, you just miss it. The third is it's so profound. It's just, we can't imagine something could be that profound. And the fourth is because it's so wonderful. You, can, you can't really believe or imagine that, that you and everything and ultimate reality is, is so wonderful. Uh, so, but it, you know, it's something you can't codify or put your finger on or, but we have put a dharma and song and we can't, we can't depend. That's refuge, right? You can't take refuge in phenomena, in beliefs, in thoughts. So Buddha said, take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Uh, but it's not like a thing, you know? It's nothing we can pin down. Um, thank you. So we have Dave and then Brenda. Um, I know we're running late, so I'll try to keep this brief. I had just one question. And I just quickly before getting to the question, I wanted to go back to what Umar and Anna were both saying. Um, I just saw a, a very interesting documentary on Netflix last night called The Social Dilemma. Yeah. And uh, some of you have probably seen it, but I really recommend it. Yeah. Uh, in, in particular, the phrase that Umar was talking about, about paying attention. Uh, you know, when you pay something, it means you're paying for something, you're paying the price. And the, uh, 
like what Anna was saying, if you're getting something for free on the internet, you're not the customer, you're the product. Uh, I really recommend this, this documentary to everybody. Oh, me too. Yeah, on Netflix, The Social Dilemma. Uh, David, the question I had for you is you mentioned that uh, when you see, you know, hair tonic and floor wax and so forth named Zen, uh, that it doesn't, you know, really bother you that much. Uh, and I know what you mean. It's sort of mildly annoying and everything. I must admit that I've gotten a little bit annoyed recently. Uh, there's a place that's opened in downtown Los Altos, really just a short walk from the site of Haiku Zendo. And it's called the I Chakra Zen Center. And really what it is is a new age store that sells scented candles and magical bath crystals. Now it's the what chakra? The eye chakra, like it was an I? app on your iPhone, the eye chakra. I is in the eye we see with? No, no, like the letter I. The eye chakra? Yeah, like iPhone, right? Eye chakra. Oh, gee, <laughs> anyway, wow. Anyway, it's, it's still, you know, I'm trying very hard not to get offended by this thing. But uh, I'm curious about, about one thing, you know, we, we have all of this sort of, uh, declawed uh, Eastern wisdom coming into Western society in various forms, including the whole mindfulness movement. Uh, you know, John Kabat-Zinn and all of this, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction, like mindfulness and meditation are tools to reduce stress. And I'm just kind of wondering about your perspective on this. You know, it, it reminds me a little bit of something I heard uh, Michael Pollan say after a talk that he gave, somebody was complaining not about spiritual practice, but about organic food and saying, oh, this has all been co-opted by, you know, the big corporations and everything is stamped or organic now. And, and the whole movement is getting all sort of diluted. And Michael Pollan said, you have to understand that the way that movements impact society at large is by being co-opted. And I'm just, I find it a little hard to swallow, but I'm just wondering what your take is on the relationship of our spiritual practice to these more secular notions of meditation as a technique to accomplish something. Uh oh, is he gone? Yes. Oh, oh dear. I wasn't brief enough. <laughs> oh, so many things. Well, we all got to hear you. Yes. <laughs> Whatever that's. <laughs> I think he just dropped off at the end. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I wish I had mentioned that to him. It would be better if he could connect with his phone, even if it's just for the audio. But uh, yeah. I think we're about at the end anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'd like to wait a few more minutes for him. He was wonderful. Yes. Yeah, too he bad that he had this internet connection problems. He said that the usually it works well for him. Do you have his phone, Teresa? Do you have I phone? don't. No, I communicated with him by email. I wonder, Les, do you have his phone? I just realized that, no, he's in Burma, or not in Burma. Yeah. He, um, in, in Bali, yeah. Bali. Yeah, so then he'd get long distance charges, so that wouldn't work either. Oh, not, not on his cell phone. On a cell phone, he can call. No, him. depends not on, on, on the phone, phone carrier. Phone. Yeah, it depends on the carrier, I guess. But it yeah. might be a bit more challenging. Well, maybe that's why the Wi Fi is not great, too, if it's uh, from Bali to here or something. Right. It was nice. <laughs> Trip to Bali. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> did anybody uh, hear the Other tropical regions. birds behind him? Yeah, I did. Nice. He's back. Here we are again. All right. Go back, David. Um, this is unusual. Um, but um, anyway. So where were we before we were so rudely interrupted? 
Um, I was just asking about how you feel about things like secularized meditation as a technique for stress reduction and how that interacts with practice, right? I mean, is it is it maybe an on-ramp to practice or is it a distraction that keeps people from getting into real practice? Well, the secularization of, you mean just like that store saying I chakra? No, I mean, I mean more serious things like John Kabat-Zinn and mindfulness based stress reduction. Oh, it's all right. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of accepting. Uh, I mean, some things get sort of out there, but uh, I mean, there's just all sorts of weird messages and some of them, but John Cap is in, he's pretty solid, uh, you know. I remember um, going to an all-day retreat with him one time, and at some point during the day, he said, you have to remember that I'm not a Buddhist teacher. And my immediate reaction was, you could have fooled me, fella. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just, you know, there's really just a whole zoo of things, just uh, all sorts of stuff happening out there. Um, and... Uh, you can't keep up with all of it. And so I'd say don't try to, I'm, I, I, you know, I lead a pretty simple life now. You know, I live in a very small world, but I am connected to the internet, but I don't follow everything. I'm on Facebook, but I don't, I don't, I spend about 20 minutes, 30 minutes on it a day. That's it. I don't follow I'm very, you know, I don't spend too much time. I've spent a lot of time following the election, but mainly uh, statistical stuff. Um, and uh, I, I wish us all good luck with that. But, you know, to me, climate change is such an overwhelming problem that uh, we're all worried about, you know, I don't know, I can't say we're all worried, but a great high percentage of the people I know who are Americans are very worried about very specific political problems in the future in America. And I think there's a big tidal wave coming in that's gonna just make everything else irrelevant. Uh, and um, I think that the civilization will be, uh, will really have to change, people will have to change uh, uh, the human race is not prepared for what's coming. Of course, we don't know exactly what's coming either, but we're not preparing for uh, some pretty serious possibilities. Uh, so um, I'd say uh, uh, focusing on Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is always a good bet. <laughs> because I don't think phenomena is going to pay off. <laughs> but I've enjoyed it. It's been good so far, mainly. Um, but I think we're lucky to have run into Buddhism. I think we keep that in mind, because it doesn't matter, ultimately. Uh, I mean, it matters to us what happens. But it's not going to change the big picture, you know. The, the way the Hindus look at it is really good. You know, you've got your creator and your destroyer and you're keeping it all together. But, you know, worlds come and go. Lives come and go. Uh, very close old Dharma brother of mine died about 12 hours ago, a Loring Palmer, early Suzuki Roshi student. Uh, read, uh, I just did a podcast with him uh, like two weeks ago or something. I put it up or three weeks ago. Uh, very interesting fellow, Loring Palmer. Um, and he died with a slight smile on his face. It's really nice. I saw a picture of it. His brother sent me. And uh, 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 and, and, you know, there's so many people that are 
that contacted him toward the end and are aware of him. And uh, I'm in touch with Wendy Piercing. She, she does a lot of work for uh, QG Archives. She, she spends, she's working on, on uh, light edits of all of the verbatim lectures, uh, Suzuki Roshi lectures. With, there, we got a little team doing that. I've done a lot of it through the years, <laughs> but um, she's very, very good worker. And you know, her, hus her husband wrote Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And their son, Chris, was murdered on November 17th, uh, 1979, near the Zen Center. Well, again, it was a big, big deal. And, uh, but somebody commented, I was reading, I, I just, I have a, I, I, I just worked on a page for Chris. And uh, I have a post already set to go up on November 17th for that page. And it has the newspaper clipping for that day. And somebody commented, you know, people get killed every day, but not everybody who gets killed have a hundred people <laughs> standing around them, you know, until their body is taken away. So, um, and then people continued being with him even though it was a murder investigation, they allowed people to uh, continue sitting with him, you know, right up until when he was cremated. And um, so that's, that's a nice aspect of Sangha, I think. Is, um, so, you know, we might be on a ship that's sinking, but the band is playing. But isn't it time for you all to go about your busy lives? Yep. <laughs> yep. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for spending your time with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being there. Okay. Thank you. I, yeah. Thank you, David. That was a beautiful, um, beautiful. You. Yeah. Um, well, for whoever's left, we're going to quickly close with the four vows, if you don't mind. Um, Uh-oh. I hit leave meeting. <laughs> You're still here, David. Oh, good. It's, it gave me a second chance. All right. Good. No problem.